be seated. It's a real pleasure for me to be here with you today. So many familiar faces and uh, old friends. Makes it feel like coming home. Today, uh, unlike some of my visits in the past, I come as a representative of the Lutheran Heritage Foundation whose mission is to translate, publish, distribute, and introduce books. Books that are biblically faithful and solidly Lutheran throughout the world. And because the fundamental mission of the Lutheran Heritage Foundation is to proclaim Jesus Christ and him crucified to the world, uh, I want you to know that I have no intention whatsoever of preaching to you about the Lutheran Heritage Foundation right now. Uh, we're going to preach about Jesus Christ and him crucified according to the texts that we've just heard. But I do think, I do think that it's only fair of me to warn you that before we say amen to this thing, there will be a commercial. So grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. These are the words of our Lord that come immediately after his Beatitudes, which we heard last Sunday. See the crowd, he went up on the mountain and sat down and his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, blessed are you, you who are poor in spirit, you who mourn, you who are meek, you who hunger and thirst for righteousness, you who are merciful, you peacemakers, you, you persecuted, for righteousness sake, blessed are you. It has struck me, and I'm sure that it has struck you, that the way Jesus describes the blessed person may not be exactly the same way you and I think about being blessed. In our move from the north to the south, we have heard a good deal of bless your heart. And I'm fairly confident that none of the Beatitudes that you dear Southerners have bestowed upon this Northerner meant anything close to what Jesus said when he said, blessed are you. In fact, I think we would all agree that the character and the quality of blessedness that Jesus uses to describe his disciples is about as counterintuitive and countercultural as you can get. Which of us can even begin to imagine a political candidate campaign for your support, promising that if elected, he will create for you these nine conditions for your life. Elect me and I will make you poor in spirit. And you will be persecuted for righteousness sake. And you will mourn. And you will be meek. Won't you please vote for me? As we heard St. Paul write to the Corinthians, this is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age. And yet, this is who Jesus puts his blessing on. And having received their blessing, this is who they are. But now that they are so blessed by Jesus, what is he to do with these blessed ones? These who are so countercultural, so counterintuitive, what does he do with them? Are they to be gathered up and taken out of this world, say, to the island of bliss? Or are they to be left in the world? 
Well, one day they will be gathered up from this world and taken to this Isle of Bliss, but not until the last day comes. To his blessed ones, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world, which is to say, having now put his blessing on them, he sends them out into the world. No sooner does he put his blessing on his poor, mournful, meek, hungry, thirsty, peacemaking disciples, than he sends them out into the world as salt and light, knowing full well that this world will not receive them well. They will be rejected and persecuted for righteousness sake. And yet, and yet, this is precisely what this world needs. In a world that believes that personal guilt is to be avoided at all costs by placing the blame anywhere but on me, what this world really needs is your poverty of spirit. In a world that prides itself on being proud of whatever feels good, whatever seems right, believing that my ways are really better than God's ways, what this world needs is your mournfulness. In a world that is driven by power, and a hunger and thirst for whatever works and whatever is profitable, no matter what suffering it might cause. This world needs your meekness, your hunger and thirst for righteousness, your mercy, your working for peace. In a world that firmly believes that might makes right, no matter who gets hurt, this world needs your willingness, your gift of suffering, persecution for righteousness sake, simply because it's the right thing to do. So maybe now you're beginning to think, hey, this sounds an awful lot like Jesus Christ. Because you could just as easily have inserted the name of Jesus into each of these little scenarios and it would have fit him perfectly. And if that's what you're thinking, then good for you. As Jesus sends his blessed ones out to be salt of the earth and light of the world, they go in his name, in his stead, with his blessing, to the point that in his own words, whoever hears you hears me. Whoever receives you receives me. So who would have ever thought? Who would have ever thought that the ultimate remedy of all of this world's problems is to be found in, of all things, the meekness, the lowliness, the mercy, the peacemaking of Jesus Christ and him crucified, who is sprinkled, who is shined onto this world through his blessed ones. Clearly, not a wisdom of this age, not the wisdom of the rulers of this age, yet clearly the wisdom of God. So radically countercultural so radically counterintuitive. You want to be a real radical in this world. Here's what real radical looks like. You are the salt of the earth. In Jesus' day, salt was a basic commodity of life, hard to live without. Before refrigeration, salt was used for, to preserve food from spoiling. And it was also critical to basic first aid to sterilize wounds and cuts. And if ever you've poured salt on an open wound, you know that it stings and it bites, even as it preserves and brings healing. 
And so Jesus calls his disciples salt. They do not become salt. They are salt. By virtue of the fact that he put his blessing on them. They are the salt of the earth. And he sends them out into a wounded and a decaying world for healing and for preserving. Ultimately, he will send them to all nations, even to the ends of the earth, because the whole world needs to be salted with Jesus Christ. They are not to simply sprinkle, but they are to pour out with all measure, overflowing in abundance, the salt of Jesus' life onto a wounded and rotting world. And as salt does, it stings, and it burns, and it makes you cry out, what then shall we do? And it's right there, right at that point, that the healing begins to do its work. For the sting of death is sin, but his forgiveness takes away all of our sin and it renews our life and it even raises us up from the dead and we cry out thanks be to God who gives us this healing and preserves our life through Jesus Christ our Lord we are the salt of the earth you me us we are the salt of the earth wherever God happens to sprinkle and scatter us, first and foremost in our own families, in our own neighborhoods, in our communities, where we work, where we go to school. We are the salt of the earth, and we bring the healing and the preserving qualities of Jesus to a wounded and a decaying world. And it shouldn't surprise us if as we season this world with the saltiness of Christ that it may not be received with the welcome that it deserves. As much as we wish he had, Jesus did not say, you are the sugar of the earth. Ask any dentist and he'll tell you, sugar just promotes decay. We remember the words that we were given. Blessed are you when they speak all manner of evil against you falsely on account of me. Take this as a sign that the salt is doing its work. You are the light of the world, says Jesus. Light reveals. That's what the season of Epiphany that we're in is all about. The baby born of Mary is revealed to be the Son of God. Matthew tells us that the prophet Isaiah was pointing his finger right at Jesus when he said the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them a light has shone. And just like salt that stings and that burns, light is not always welcomed as it should be either. John puts it like this. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world. But people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. And so once again, we shouldn't be surprised if the reaction of a lost and a confused world that doesn't know the way or the truth or the life might say, hey, hey, your light is hurting my eyes. Put a basket over it. Or much worse, in their love of the darkness, they revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. Once again, remember the words that you were given. Rejoice and be glad, for so they persecuted the prophets who came before you. For so they persecuted the light of the world who was before you. Jesus continues, 
Let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Notice he doesn't say, when they see how spiritual or religious or how pious you are. When they see your good works. So in the Old Testament reading that we just heard, the prophet Isaiah pours salt and light onto the people of God who are all about being religious with their fasting, even while they were severely lacking in good works. Listen again. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. You oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and fight and hit with a wicked fist. By their fasting, the people of God they were trying to shine a light on themselves so that God would see them and bless them. Never realizing that God had already put his blessing on them by his grace as a free gift in their poverty of spirit, in their mournfulness for their sin. If only they knew how blessed by God they already are. How he had put his blessing on them so that they might be a blessing to others. Is not this the fast that I choose, says the Lord, to loose the bonds of wickedness, undo the straps of the yoke, let the oppressed go free, break every yoke, share your bread with the hungry, bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked, cover him. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as noonday. Or as Jesus puts it so much more succinctly, they will see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. To which I say, really? Really, Jesus? I don't know about any of you, but I've rarely ever experienced it, frankly. For the most part, I'd say that the good works that we do go mostly unnoticed altogether. Every once in a while, we might get a thank you letter or a bless your heart. And I don't know that I've ever heard anyone say, well, you know that good work you just did for me, that did it. That did it. And now I'm going to give all the glory to God the Father. I'd never once have heard that. But Jesus said, they will see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And Jesus is the very word of God, which means that his word is infallible, which means that it always does just what it says. And so maybe he's not talking, maybe he's not talking about now. Maybe he's talking about later. Maybe he's even referring to that future and final day when he comes again in glory and every knee bows, and every tongue confesses, and every eye sees. And what will they see? <laughs> what will we see? The answer is everything. Everything. What we were too blind to see in the darkness is revealed in the glorious light of this light of the world. Now I see the good works that your Christians did, but purifying and sanitizing and darkness scattering and light giving thing it was for me and for this world. And I know that it might be too late. I pray that it's not too late. But either way, I have to say thank you, Jesus. 
and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So let's not, let's not get hung up on whether or not anyone sees our good works and gives glory to God for you. That's simply not what drives us to be salt and light in this world. That's what drove Israel. That's what drove the scribes and the Pharisees of Jesus' day. They did their good works in order to be seen by men and glorified by men. But let your righteousness exceed theirs. Rather than waiting for our neighbor to acknowledge our good works, getting, getting resentful, resentful, frustrated when he doesn't, it's enough to know that someday he will. And one day, your Father who is in heaven will get all of the glory that is rightfully his. But until then, until then, let us just be salt of the earth and light to the world. The work of the, this is the commercial. The work of the Lutheran Heritage Foundation is to equip men and women, boys and girls, to grow in their knowledge and understanding of Jesus Christ as they follow him and strive to be salt to the earth and light to the world. The Christian Church is blessed to have several organizations that do the hard work of translating, distributing the Bible in many languages. But there are not many organizations who do the equally hard work of translating, publishing, distributing, and introducing books. Books that help men and women, boys and girls, understand the Christian faith and grow in it. This is the work of the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Because of our sinful nature, the Christian message of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, for Christ's sake alone, would never be known or believed unless someone spoke this unnatural word of God in a language that they can understand. Unless someone does this hard work, people will never know that they have a loving God who loves them, not because they are better than some, not as bad as others, but because he created them and he redeemed them. And he has united himself to them in their baptism where he remains with them. They learn just how blessed they are only if someone speaks and teaches them in a language they can understand. And so books like Luther's Small Catechism Child's Garden of Bible Stories, translated into now 140 different languages, feeds the hunger to learn more about this gracious God we have. These are just two of the 1,274 publications that the Lutheran Heritage Foundation is currently producing and distributing all at no cost. The entire cost is borne by individuals, congregations, and organizations of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And today, it is my pleasure to humbly invite you to become a part of this good work. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Amen.